February on the Great Barrier Reef, height of summer, water's warming up, and most years with a changing climate we tend to get coral bleaching. It's fairly regular in the last few years, especially with severe bleaching events through 2016 and 17. And there's already been articles in 2022 about scientists being concerned about potential bleaching this year. It's just gone January. We haven't even hit the height of summer yet and there's already signs of bleaching across many parts of the Great Barrier Reef. We went out to do some regular monitoring at the Museum of Underwater Art at John Brewer Reef offshore from Townsville here and took the opportunity to do a little bit of an assessment of the bleaching stress at the moment to see how the reef is going. And so one of the things people ask often is, is what is bleaching? And coral bleaching is a mechanism that happens when the water gets warmer above its normal summer maximums um, for long periods of time and it causes a breakdown in the relationship between the symbiotic algae living inside the tissue of the coral called zooxanthellae and the coral host animal itself. The colour in a coral comes from the symbiotic algae which is a plant and it photosynthesizes sunlight and that gives the coral the brown, green or red colour that you see when you go out onto the reef. When that relationship breaks down the coral host is being damaged through over metabolism by the zooxanthellae and so to protect itself it expels that symbiont algae and so now without the algae inside its tissue all you're seeing is the white skeleton through the translucent or clear coral animal tissue so it's a pretty complex mechanism when corals bleach they get rid of their symbiont algae which provides a great percentage of their food in some species up to 90% of their food comes from the symbiont algae. And so when the coral has expelled that algae, it's essentially starving and struggling to survive. So it's not dead. Whether or not it's gonna die or not really depends on what happens in the coming days and weeks. If the water temperature cools and the sunlight intensity retreats, the coral may get that algae back in its tissue, like reaccumulate symbiotic algae, and return to its healthy, vibrant self. But if stressful conditions continue, the likelihood that that coral dies increases. So how long does it take for a coral to bleach? Well, marine scientists use a metric called degree heating weeks. And if the ambient water temperature is a one degree above the normal maximum historical for this location for a week, that's one degree heating week. If it's two degrees above the historical maximums for that location for a week, that counts as two degree heating weeks. So when we look at the stress on a reef, if we get to about four degree heating weeks, you could reasonably expect to see bleaching on a reef. If we get to eight degree heating weeks and above, marine scientists expect to start to see some mortality across a reef. And these are the metrics and tools that people use to look at how much stress a particular reef is under. At the moment, many parts of the reef are at four degree heating weeks and above. But in the last few weeks, we've had some cloudy weather, some rain, and this has helped to mitigate some of the heat stress across the reef. Different coral species have different response mechanisms to heat stress. So some are more resilient to the warmer temperatures than others. This may be due to evolutionary changes, they might have thicker tissues, they might be less reliant on the symbiotic algae living inside their tissue than, and they can more 
adequately compensate by feeding themselves from a survival mechanism. So you get different responses across a reef. So you'll see some areas where some corals are really white and pale and others where they've still got their deep dark brown colour. And so these are just different response mechanisms. Some are more resilient than others. Corals have fluorescent pigment in them. Most of them have fluorescent pigment inside their tissue all of the time. But they're usually not visible to the human light spectrum or what our eyes can see. When corals are stressed, they use fluorescent pigment as a type of sunscreen to try and filter the UV radiation and the light coming in to, their, to that algae. During times of stress, what they often do is upregulate the fluorescent pigments inside their tissue to shield themselves for that, from that increased UV radiation. And so this is why some corals look like they're fluorescing because they're trying to protect themselves from that heat stress. Some corals will fluoresce, some corals will never fluoresce. Some corals will have fluorescence that we can see and others might be fluorescing but it's not part of the human light spectrum so we'll never see it. So you'll see varying responses across a reef. And so when we go out to check on the reef at a particular location, people often ask when we come back, how is the reef doing? And generally it's really difficult to answer that question. The reef is 2,300 kilometres long, it covers lots of different bioregions across from the lagoon to the reef flat to the reef edge. So there's a lot going on across the reef but when we look at those coral reef areas and ask how it's doing, there were some areas that we saw out at John Brewer Reef that were spectacular, some of the best reef I've seen. Yes, they were under quite a bit of pressure at the moment and right now for the year 2022, I would consider they are at a tipping point for this season, meaning if we get a bit more wind, some rain and some cloud over the next four to eight weeks, I would expect that the majority of the corals that we saw to remain healthy and recover to their full vibrancy in the next few months. But if that's not the case, there's the potential for widespread significant bleaching across many of those corals and potential mortality. So it really depends on what happens from here. But every one of these events creates stress for those animals. You know, it erodes their resilience and just makes that a little bit harder to survive. They might have to spend energy at the moment getting through this hot period, which they won't be able to devote into growth and reproduction throughout the rest of the year. And so it's these regular stresses and disturbances that are eroding the health and resilience of the Great Barrier Reef on an ongoing scale. The best thing that we can do as humans is look at ways that we can mitigate the pressure uh, that we're putting on these reefs through a changing climate. People often ask, so, so what can I do? How can I make a difference? Well, we've been out, assessed the health of the reef and submitted some of our sightings to different management agencies as part of citizen science activities. But when we go home, you know, it's trying to live as sustainably as possible and look for those, you know, micro changes that we can make in our everyday lives. So these might be, you know, looking at the car we drive, the food we eat, the way that we use water in our home, the energy that we consume, and looking at ways that we can minimise our impact and then on a more regional scale looking at who we vote for and supporting policies and governments that are going to do more to address the threat of climate change and mitigating our carbon emissions because that is going to be the single most deciding factor on whether we have coral reefs as we know them today and as we have known for the last few decades, or whether the, it is a significantly changed ecosystem. But it is still amazing, it is still spectacular, and something that we at Reef Ecologic are really concerned and passionate about preserving 